Hi, this is Ken Jureski, and today we're talking pictures with Todd Biglow. Todd is a well-known photojournalist, photographer. He, he wears a lot of different hats, making a living with his camera. And he, uh, like all of us, has the evolved in his work and his business practices. And I think we can really learn a lot from him. Todd, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. I'm, uh, I'm uh, glad to be here with you. So um, you started out in the newspaper world, and like many of us, you, uh, I don't know if it's uh, evolved, but you kind of started getting work from magazines, and pretty soon you were not a newspaper photographer so much anymore. You were a magazine photographer, so just tell me how that works. Yeah, that was, um, that was a route that I think a lot of uh, my friends and colleagues were, were, were doing at the time. Um, I definitely had an interest in, in uh, photojournalism, of course, which we can find different avenues for. But uh, when I graduated college, I had had an internship and it just the timing was well, uh, where when the uh, internship was ending, I was graduating and somebody was leaving the newspaper. Small little daily newspaper, an afternoon daily actually, which is almost non-existent <laughs> these days. Cool. cool. Um, yeah, it was. And, and, and I'll tell you that what, what you learn at some place like that is extreme deadlines. Uh, you know, you have to learn how to produce first thing in the morning and get something out into the afternoon and then immediately begin to work on the next day's paper. So um, I was fortunate and I worked at the small newspaper in uh, Ventura County, California for, for about three years and um, then was looking to kind of uh, move on from there. And I had made some contacts with some people at the Hartford Current. Um, they weren't looking to hire staff at that time, but they were very open to the possibility for some uh, regular freelance work. They showed enough interest where my wife and I packed up our uh, our belongings here in California and uh, went back east for a period of time. A short period, actually. It turned out to be only about uh, nine months, a little less than a year. And then the LA Times uh, showed some similar interest in uh, a contract-type position. Uh, so I came back to the Times, um, worked at the LA Times for about five years under a, a regular contract. And... Uh, you know, contributed to a couple of their uh, team Pulitzers under the uh, covering the, the Northridge earthquake and the LA riots and just did some, had some great opportunities, worked with some great people there. And um, while I was there, I had uh, the opportunity to kind of start branching out into magazines, um, you know, without going too far into it. I, I think I did what a lot of us have done. I'm, I'm not sure how many people still do it these days. I do encourage it. Um, but, you know, I, packed my portfolio up and made the trip to New York and DC, uh, you know, several times a year and, uh, stayed in little hole in the wall hotels to save money and just humped my portfolio into as many magazines as I could, um, trying to uh, generate some business from, you know, time and Newsweek and us news, which, uh, you know, you've all worked for and, and, um, and then the work started to come along, you know, you just keep grinding it out and, uh, about 96, uh, the LA Times actually switched things over to a work for hire contract, which I've always been opposed to. I, I like to own my own work. And um, I took that opportunity to leave the Times and um, I had already developed a solid relationship with, with Time and uh, Newsweek and, and, and people and, and others where the transition uh, was a little softer than just stepping out into a you know, a whole new canvas. Uh, so, yeah. So just, you know, went from there and, you know, at the time I continued to freelance for, I did a lot of, you know, Washington Post work in, in the nineties and, and early on, even when I was, uh, you know, whoever came along with a good assignment, as long as the fee was, you know, within reason and the work was good. <laughs> um, you know, I took it. Tell me just, uh, so, let, me, uh, let me just you know, backtrack. Was, just backtrack and tell me what it's like you know, in Ventura County, it's a small newspaper, heavy deadlines, but there's, there's something really, really special about working for a newspaper that size and the freedom it affords you. Can you just tell me what your normal day was like? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's great. I don't get asked that much. <laughs> and um, it's so key, Ken, it really is, man. Uh, you know, it's a, you work at a small paper, I think it goes, you know, to reason that you, you pretty much have to figure everything out. Um, you're going to handle everything. So a small newspaper that I work for called the Simi Valley Enterprise, 
um, served a small community, bedroom community of, I think at the time, maybe it was 80,000 people, a couple of high schools, um, very big into sports and so forth. So my day would start early. You know, we'd have a seven o'clock meeting, 730 meeting, um, general meeting with the newsroom. And immediately the uh, managing editor would, would tell the photo staff of which usually is just me or one other, we have three staff photographers. It's Denali Mark Terrell, a, a very well-known AP photographer, a highly regarded photographer and a friend of mine uh, was also at the paper. Um, George Wilhelm, I followed his, his, uh, uh, his footsteps. He went on to the LA times from the Simi Valley paper, but we would, we would be told, okay, we need a front page picture. We have nothing to run and there's no big news. It's a bedroom community. So, you know, 7.30 in the morning, you grab your cameras and you get in your car and you start looking for what most of us newspaper photographers refer to as wild art, you know, a feature picture, uh, which isn't always easy to find in, you know, the middle of October at, at eight o'clock in the morning or something. So, you know, you had some spots and you had, but you had to produce, you, you could never come back in an hour and say, I'm sorry, I didn't find anything you had to produce something, so. And just it, like for, just to be clear, what was your deadline, like 10, 10.30, something yeah, like I that? Yeah, I think print, print had to be on desk by, if I recall, about 10 o'clock, uh, because right. the prints, the, the, the presses were right there and the presses would run and then they had to get, you know, distributed by, uh, you know, like one o'clock in the afternoon. So we would, we would come in and develop the film. So we were all filmed, so you had to shoot, quickly soup your film, oftentimes print a wet negative, slam that print down on the desk of your, you know, managing editor, pray to God, they said, okay, looks good. And, you know, you'd write a caption by pencil on the back of it. And then you take your cameras and then your day began because now you had, you know, whatever meetings, city council meetings you had to cover, things that weren't very exciting. Um, and then when the afternoon rolled around, it was almost always high school sports. Yeah, so so, just to be clear, this is black and white. This is what year is this? 80? This was, uh, so I graduated 89. I was in an internship. And so right when I graduated, I was, uh, I was going straight to work full time. So 89 till uh, I was there till like the end of 91 when I, when I went back east. So you're shooting black and white and uh, in, a, in, a, in a world that's already been um, um, Gannett uh, uh, has dropped USA Today on everybody. So now everybody's shooting color, but you're still shooting black and white. You're on a tight deadline. And you've got, once you get past that first deadline, you've kind of got, uh, you, the world is your, you, you, it's your oyster. You're, <laughs> that's your playground. You, you, you can find anything you want. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's, that, that was one of the, I, I, I attribute probably the largest section of my growth as a photographer to that very early, early period, because I, I realized the importance of, of uh, producing work on your own, um, not only producing work for your client, but also producing work that hopefully meant something to you and kept you going. So I, I at those small papers, a lot of people, especially these days, I get a lot of photographers that really, they just want to start out at the biggest publications. And I, you know, maybe in a few instances that might be best, but I really don't think it is the best. I think that you can find yourself early on when you have more control over what you can do. So as you say, yeah, oftentimes I would, I might have some time in the afternoon where I want to make sure I have a project to work on. And I did some really cool projects, you know, just some simple things. One time I did, literally, I spent the whole Thanksgiving from Thanksgiving, from the night before Thanksgiving, all the way through the night of Thanksgiving, just with a local homeless guy that kind of everybody knew. So, and then when we produced it, it had a lot of positive reaction because people knew him and saw him in the community all the time. And, you know, so little projects like that I found when the, uh, when you went off and, and, uh, you know, did the first Gulf War, I did a local angle to it, you know, so I found a local kid that, um, you know, was about ready to be, you know, sent off to, to Iraq and, and uh, went down to Camp Pendleton and did some live training with them and put together like a heartfelt piece on what it was like for a local kid to go off to war. And so you, you find that inner ability at those places where you have some control to, to, to produce, you know, and, and, and I it's think a really street. It's a two way street world. because with these small papers or with any paper, you see photographers getting burned out all the time. But if you're doing these projects, that kind of 
uh, that's, that's the remedy to ever burning out when you're engaged with your community and your subjects and your, just your work, your craft. Absolutely. I mean, we all need it. I mean, we, we still need it. <laughs> right. And, and the burnout is going to start, you know, anywhere you are, whether you're freelancing and I burn out on having to do a lot of the business side of stuff, or I burn out at my small newspaper because I'm tired of shooting portraits. I mean, Ken, we would literally do pets of the week, <laughs> you know, on a Friday, <laughs> You know, people would bring in, you know, there was a set time where they could bring it in and then somebody would just scream out from the front of the newsroom, hey, is there a photographer back there? Can you come out and shoot the pet of the week? And, you know, the dog would sit there and <laughs> shoot it. And then, okay, so you set it aside because, you know, they, it wasn't needed until it only ran one day. But yeah, of course, you're going to think, like, oh God, what am I doing? You know, but, but then you have to find that ability to to go make some good pictures. And, and let me even say like, especially in places where high school sports is so big in the Midwest and Texas and so forth. I loved it. I, yeah. you know, the photographers and I would literally like fight over who got to do like, you know, senior high school or Royal high school, a couple of high schools, cause they would battle over being, which was the best team. And, you know, you want to go out and produce some in, some of the photographers that came before me, Frank Niemeyer was at that paper, and George Wilhelm, as I mentioned. Look at Mark Terrell. I mean, you know, these guys, you know, we were producing, man, and it didn't matter if it was an NFL picture or if it was a, a high school picture. Just go out there and, and make a kick-ass picture, you know, and, and that's what fueled us. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. If you can shoot high school football at night on Tri-X, <laughs> you can you can shoot in the NFL. You can shoot anything at that point. You got the Olympics covered. You got everything. I agree. I mean, everything has its own challenges, but I absolutely agree. Especially when you look at you know the challenges we did face uh, uh, with 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 film and, and terrible lighting and and uh, you know having to get back and get it souped real quickly and 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 print it nicely too. <laughs> right. So right. yeah, absolutely. So tell me, I'm just curious, you're making this transition and it's a slow transition. You kind of did it right. You didn't just, you know, jump in and, and put all your eggs in the magazine basket, but what's that transit? What's the difference between shooting pet of the week and shooting uh, a feature story for sports illustrated? What's that transition look like? What's, what's the, the philosophy behind that because it's it's two different types of photography not, not just any newspaper the difference between newspaper and magazine photography what's how do you define that yeah i don't know if i have that definition i'm i might still be trying to figure that out <laughs> um to some degree you know that you're 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 100 on point um I, you know when i first started to make that foray into magazines um you know one of the first things i did was make contact with um i was fortunate to make contact with a, a great editor black star and stack an agency rep and was stack? Really, yeah, Annie, yeah, yeah okay, great yeah, she was she was a wonderful woman um it was about the time that howard chapnick had just left um uh or was no no longer involved with the daily affairs and so forth and i got some good guidance because i think ann saw more of a newspaper mentality which i think relates to being sometimes a little bit more rigid in your interpretation of what you should be shooting when you have an assignment. So, you know, some of us have heard things like, oh, well, that has a wire service look to it, or that has a newspaper look to it. Those can be good things, but they can also be kind of rigid. So I, I, I think I started to find my uh, own uh, voice, so to speak, visual voice, once I started to feel a little bit more freedom to kind of create images as I was interested in creating them, and whether that was compositionally, lighting wise, or just trying to really create my own look, um, you know, none of us were going to reinvent the wheel, but you know, I had that interest and it didn't always work with newspapers. So when you shoot like deep pictures, I, you know, when we were shooting with, when I started with the magazines, we were all shooting chromes, you know? And so, you know, I, I love to underexpose that coat of chrome. I love to, you know, really go deep with my shoot for the highlights and go deep with the shadows. And, uh, you know, you do that for, for even the LA times and, you know, they're, they're not going to use it. They're going to open that up tremendously. Um, where I found a little bit more of a receptive audience transitioning over into some of the magazines where um, they were a, a little bit more willing to push that look. What I found, and 
I think this is what you're describing is um, when the newspaper world, you kind of shoot what they, they're, they're expecting. And if you do that, then you're the hero for the day. In the magazine world, if you try to play that game, um, you have a very short shelf life. Absolutely. And so the key for me, and I don't, you know, I wouldn't recommend this for everybody, but the key to me was to care less what the magazine could want and shoot pictures that I saw and just embrace my own vision. And as long as I did that, I was successful. As long as I tried to, and as soon as I tried to like give them what they wanted, that's when I, I'd get into trouble. I, yeah, that's, um, boy, you know, words, words, you know, those are true words, man. Um, and it's actually, you know, reminds me of something that uh, Jim Colton, who we all know, uh, you know, former director at Newsweek, and, you know, I worked with him at, at Sports Illustrated. In fact, the work I did for many years at Sports Illustrated was solely because when Jim went over there, you know, he, he reached out to me to do some work. And um, okay, I never sought Sports Illustrated. You know, he was just looking for a certain style for some of the stories. And so I'm deeply indebted to him for, for many things. But one of the things that Jim actually, you know, wrote for a little testimonial, which I, I'm pretty sure is still even up on my website, was exactly what you just said, was that he could in, count on me to not just produce what um, was needed by the magazine, but then to take it to another level where, you know, you, they were receiving something that was unexpected, better oftentimes than what they were really expecting. Um, and and that, that meant a lot to me because that's always what I tried to do is make sure I could produce for my client because I want to keep the client, but I really wanted to produce, you know, something that was me and how I interpreted and saw it. And something that's super important about that is, I think that's changed a lot, Ken. And I think that is a direct result of a lack of budgets and a lack of resources and also that desire to have the story predetermined so that now you're being asked to go out and produce what either the writer or the editors have determined is the look of the story. And you're just asked to kind of produce that. And, you know, I can think of... Uh, several occasions, one of which was with Sports Illustrated with a story I pitched uh, when it was, uh, you know, received, um, they were a little shocked, <laughs> you know, and, and I think the shocking is good because I'm the one that's on the ground looking and seeing this. Um, you should be a little bit more receptive of it. Uh, whereas today, I think it's more like, look, this is what we want you to do. This is where it, you need to go. Um, we'll give you a day to shoot this, um, and then we need the film. Yeah, that kind of sums up our, our modern world. Um, I think, can we look at some of your images? Would that? Uh, sure. Okay, let's do that. Let me figure out how to do this. Um, I really... Uh, so you you spent a lot of time on the border, and I think it was was it uh, did it start out self assigned or did yes. you okay yeah so you're 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 what forty fifty miles from the border where you're living uh, mm, two hundred oh really? <laughs> yeah I'm too San Diego for some reason um no I'm up in L A I'm uh, uh, one of the suburbs of L A so. Uh, yeah, the borders, I think if I was to go door to door, about 189 miles, 190 miles. But a lot of time I spent was, uh, you know, that's, that's to the San Ysidro port. So oftentimes I spent a lot of time along that border way inland on the, on the eastern San Diego County line, Imperial County line and so forth. So, so I was making sometimes, uh, you, know, four, you know, 400 mile one way um, sometimes. So... You know, definitely 250 because I spent over a year with one story uh, that was way out in the eastern county, and that was about uh, 275 miles. Yeah, each and way. As a as a photojournalist, that's perfectly acceptable. We will we'll yeah. accept that. I mean, never. Th I, yeah, I never had any issues with that at all. In fact, I would just say to my wife, "Hey, I'm going to be at the border this weekend. I'll you know I'll be home late on Sunday or Monday or something like that." And 
you know, beep me. <laughs> right, beep me. <laughs> if needed. Actually, at, at where I was doing this one story, for off, uh, oftentimes there's just no signal. So I had to leave a number for uh, the resident who I was kind of profiling and said, call and eventually they'll find me somewhere on the property. <laughs> oh, different times, right? I mean, yeah. There's nothing worse than being uh, in the wilds of Montana on horseback and receiving a call. Yeah, Just, uh, I'm sure you can relate to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so tell me about this image. It's pretty, uh, you, you, this is uh, one of your better known images. Tell me about it. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, this is right down there uh, where actually, you know, there's a lot of time is being spent now by photographers and migrants along this section. This is called Friendship Park. It's actually one of the first areas that I began. This was relatively early in a long, uh, you know, uh, several decades of shooting along the border, a couple of decades of shooting along the border. Um, this was a, so the way all this kind of transpired, Ken, was in the early 90s, the, 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 the border became a, uh, an issue, you know, especially in Southern California, they're trying to pass what was called Proposition 187, which is basically going to be a, a law that stripped undocumented immigrants of, of every capacity to use any services or have any rights in California. So it touched off me wanting to look at the issue a little bit more deeply. And uh, so I just started to make forays down to the border, um, literally just, just, just drive up to the border and figure out what was going on. Um, and this was one of the places, you know, you can see the sea off to the right there. That's um, uh, right there in San, in San Diego, it's San Diego County. It's called Imperial Beach. And um, yeah, this was, this was a border. And oftentimes, um, you know, holes were cut in that fence. And on Sundays, um, the border patrol would literally stand off to the side and families would kind of slip through uh, both ways and just greet and hug and they would share barbecue. This was literally like what days would be like. And, and um, it was often a place where you could just find uh, images that I thought reflected what the the difference between these two worlds were, which was basically just a chain link fence. <laughs> it's such a, it's such a well-crafted image. And I'll just, I mean, for um, photographers out there, if you're shooting, hoping to shoot for magazines, this is a well-crafted image because uh, you have that, uh, the symbolism of the, the chain link fence and the, the people against the chain link fence, the, the, the light is catching their faces and kind of a, just a splash of light across their faces, giving them a little bit of personality. You have that silhouette, that strong silhouette. And then you have the, 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 the sunset lighting up the actual, the border. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you have room. You can use this as a double truck. You can use this uh, across two and a third pages or one and a third, one and two thirds pages. It's, if a magazine editor gets an image like this across their desk, they can use it uh, that week or they can use it six months down the road. And that's, uh, for lack of a, a clear definition, that's kind of uh, your job as a magazine photographer to make lasting images that uh, speak to bigger issues, not just the father and son against right. the fence, but things that, that transcend just the, the direct meaning of the image. So that's something if you're talking about uh, the difference between newspaper and magazine work, that would, this would be a good example. Yeah, I agree with all that. Thanks. Yeah. What do we have here? Um, this was actually just an image that I'd shot. This was an assignment for sports illustrator way up near the top of uh, Hudson Bay, uh, about a hundred miles from the Arctic circle. Um, this is the type of work that, um, that I was asked to do a lot for Sports Illustrated, kind of, uh, you know, behind the scenes, just go hang out with people, uh, draw from my, uh, draw from my photojournalism background. So I spent, um, I forget what it was, four or five days with this young man, Jordan Tutu, who's the first Inuit to uh, be drafted in the NHL. He had yet to report to his first uh, professional hockey camp, you know, uh, at the beginning of the season. So, um, you know, it was, it's just one of those great assignments where you're just told, hey, just go show what it's like to live his life as, uh, as an Inuit. And so we're out on the Hudson Bay and he's uh, heading out to hunt some seal. Um, so there's a couple um, important aspects with this image. I mean, you said, first of all, it's like you 
just go up there and hang out for four or five days. One, as a ph- photographer, as a photojournalist, you got to be a person that can do it, do it, <laughs> hang out with somebody, yeah. hang out with a stranger right. for five days and, right. and have, have that stranger welcome you into their life. So that's number one. That's, that's a, that's a pretty important talent that not everybody has. Right. And then, so just contrast if this, uh, if this assignment came up today, it would be what? Go out and light a portrait of the guy standing on the ice? You know, without, without, I, if I had to bet, I would bet it'd be something more along those lines. Um, you know, without being overly cynical about it is it's, you know, it has been the evolution of how most publications have decided to pursue this type of feature uh, photography. Um, they either choose to not um, allot the resources for it or they don't have the resources for it. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to that without knowing which publication. Um, at this time, and this was, you know, maybe 10 years ago, um, you know, SI did have the resources for this and, and they saw it as a potential for a strong uh, visual story. And, um, and it turned out to be a strong visual story. Let me go back to what you were saying real quick, Ken. Uh, the art of hanging out is photojournalism. The fact that you stated that way is just so exactly in line with how I try to explain to young photographers what photojournalism is and how it's little different from photography or commercial photography. Right, right. Uh, you really need to, yeah, I mean, we landed, you know, the writer and I, after two days of traveling to get there, we landed at like 11 p.m., the light is up for 23 and a half hours to the day. And there was very little like prior communications. They said, oh, just, you know, holler at us when you get into, into this little town. And then, you know, it was like midnight or something. They said, oh, come by, everybody's over here. We're drinking beers. And because that time of year, you know, life goes on as much as possible. They basically would sleep when they're tired and go because once it gets dark, you know, later in the year, it's dark so much that they can't do anything. So they live for every moment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I loved this family. They took me in. I mean, we, were, I, we didn't stay with them, but it was just fantastic. We just hung out. You know, we went out on the water, whatever they wanted to do. I said, just live your life. Let me just be a part of it. Um, you know, you bust open a beer or two and, you know, you eat some food and you, you live life like we do, but you just try to record what it's like. And um, I think, I think that's key, but also you need to produce those images, you know, that try to really capture that, that what his life is really like. And, and, um, you know, he's a determined young man. This, this, he's a fire plug. Like when he hit people on the ice, he just recently retired when he hit people on the ice for his like five foot eight stature, he destroyed them, you know? So I wanted something that kind of showed that, uh, you know, kind of that stature. And I felt, or they felt this was actually one of the, I think this was the lead, lead image. No, it looks, it has the feel of a lead image. And I just, that idea of just hanging out, if you, it, and, and, and you don't get to hang out if you don't make pictures. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you go it's there it. and hang out and you're best friends and you don't come back with any pictures. You don't get to hang out the next time. You're done. No, it's done. That's the freelance world. You're done. <laughs> yeah. So here's back, we're back on the border. And once again, you're working that light. Tell me about this. Yeah, this was, you know, this is same thing. Again, you know, I, I, I tend to tor- sort of gravitate towards images that I feel have, uh, you know, you, you know, specific meaning and important significance. So again, as I was shooting this story um, and I started to travel to New York to show, you know, some of this work, I started to pick up some assignment work. So now there's going to be some mixed in assignment work from from time and newsweek and der spiegel and some others um as a topic kind of you know became a little bit more of a national topic which it's hard to believe that it wasn't a national topic before but trust me it wasn't at one point we uh, and stack and i were being told that this was more of a west coast uh, story so this this was just an image late in the day you always try to work with the good light but you know you had to be where things were so uh you know, I was just hanging out. Literally, this is, these are migrants that are actually being chased back over the fence into Mexico. Um, but you have to walk up. So I, I would get there in the middle of the day and just try to make myself as uh, unthreatening and to try to explain who and what I was because, you know, there's criminal elements. Um, there's a lot of people that are just looking for a better life. Um, 
but I, I couldn't do that. Even though this is shot probably with like a 70 to 200, this was, I'm just hanging out with these people and it actually happened very quickly. So, uh, you know, all of a sudden a van appeared and they all took off running back and, you know, this was all chrome. So you have to be constantly monitoring the light. So when you turn and swing and shoot, um, you know, there's no saving, you know, a chrome if it's uh, poorly exposed. So um, they popped up and then suddenly everybody started to, you know, run back towards the fence and I just fired off a few images. So the interesting thing you brought up, I was just in the, the podcast before this, I was talking to uh, David Buto, who we already mentioned somehow. Uh, he's in Hong Kong right now. And we talked about di that dynamic and you just mentioned it here. Um, if you were working with the Border Patrol on this day, you wouldn't have gotten this image. You no. had to kind of, for lack of a better word, you had to embed yourself with, uh, with the, 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 the guys trying to cross the fence. So they had to, they had to uh, just get comfortable with you being there before anything's going to happen. A hundred percent. Right. And so... And then, but you could have been, in another day, you could have been spending uh, your time with the Border Patrol and, and shooting their side of the story. And then you, you wouldn't make, so, you know, with, with David, sometimes you're on the protester side, sometimes you're on the cop side, and you kind of just uh, become familiar to them so you can make pictures. Uh, and that changes every day. I just, it's just a... You know. Yes, I, I, and I think you're going to find that component running through most of photojournalism, most most of good storytelling. You have good to be story. able to, right? You have to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The good storytellers, the 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 ones who uh, can make a lasting image. That's they have that skill, the the ability yeah. to go back and forth. What's right. going on here? Um, Is this again, a golf tournament? Yeah, it's a golf okay. tournament. <laughs> so this is the only golf tournament that I, so again, a Sports Illustrated assignment, this was 2015, um, the U.S. Open, um, a very big deal, right? So one of, I think, uh, the U.S. Open is the oldest sporting event in America. So I was asked to go up there for a week, this is in Tacoma, Washington, and uh, not shoot golf. <laughs> nice. That was the U.S. Event's assignment. It was, you know, like they wanted me to go up there and basically just, I had a blank canvas, Ken. So they were dedicating an entire uh, part of the golf uh, website, which golf.com is owned, was owned by Sports Illustrated. And um, they were just going to be updating it throughout the day as I just shot whatever the hell I wanted to That's shoot. That's beautiful. That's the best. It, it was the best assignment. Yeah, it was the best assignment. So, you know, I would spend some time on the course, but I would spend a lot of time off the course as well. This just struck me as a funny thing. I actually wrote a funny blog about it called um uh cattle pens and prozac my first u.s open nice. you know i just see this as like a cattle pen i mean so so much of golf when you really look at it is is very intriguingly unique and somewhat odd <laughs> so i just saw this as a like wow like you know they're herding them in and they're gonna let them out well you know you're, you're you know where you are you know you'd open that up and you're gonna brand them <laughs> hit them with a <laughs> we're going to service them as they say. Yes, they're going to service these people. Yeah. So I, it's just a funny image for me. And I think it just represents a little bit more uh, of the capacity to have your own vision to some degree, you know, and just be able to, 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 to tell, you know, and, and not have any real binders on. I mean, it's, it's, it's your perfect dream assignment whenever you get one of those. And, they used to come by uh, fairly often. The first one I remember I was just amazed with, and this was like, in, I wasn't sure, it was like 84 maybe. And Liberation assigned Gio Perez, and it, this is print, this is pre-internet. So they assigned him to shoot the Con Film Festival. And all he needed to do was produce one image a day, and that was gonna be their, their coverage of the festival. So can you imagine just like, Letting Gio Perez run. Yeah, with wild. his style, go shoot that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's when the magic happens, right? I mean. Right. But, you know, let's, you know, to turn the tables a little bit on you, you know, uh, obviously coming up through magazines and so forth, I was, you know, wildly familiar with your work, Ken. I mean, and, and uh, you know, Dave Vito and I go way back, you know, way, way back to the early 90s. And, 
Uh, he was working, you know, with the magazine and building his name and, and profile through there. Youngie Kim as well. You know, there's a lot of people that I really followed. And I saw you guys doing all the same thing. I mean, you know, uh, you know, your, your, your election coverage, um, I would like to think, man, this was, this was you. You know, you were on the bus, you were on the campaign, and you were producing what you saw. I mean, that's pretty much that blank canvas, you know. There are certain things and point pictures that I think sometimes, you know, magazines are always uh, uh, looking for you to, to make sure that you deliver. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're, you have that canvas and they're asking Ken to paint it. And, and that's, that's a dream. Well, I'm, I mean, and just to keep my humility intact, I can't take any credit for that as Artie Grace, who, you know, we all know, Arthur right. Grace, great Newsweek magazine photographer. Uh, he was talking to some writer was asking about the campaign work during that time. And he said, uh, you know, he's Artie's the most honest guy in the world. He said, Jureski doesn't, doesn't know the first thing about politics. All he knows is he has to make a good picture. <laughs> so, and that's all I did know. I had no clue. I was just great. Let's make a picture that yeah. they, they set the stage for me. Now I just got to find a picture. And, and I don't play, and I don't play golf. <laughs> you know? I mean, of the, of the event coverage that I did for sports illustrated, I did a, I did a, you know, fair share of event coverage all over the country, PGA tour and LPGA tour where I'd be asked to go cover the tournament, but I don't play golf. Like, and it doesn't appeal to me. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll watch the majors and that type of stuff. It doesn't appeal to me on that level, which is why I think perhaps they wanted me to do this because I wasn't a golf lover. I might actually find some right, you know, right. perspectives on this. <laughs> no, the, uh, the, the, the counterintuitive assigning of photographers is a lost art, I think. Put yeah. the, take, the, take, the, take the fish and throw them on the beach and see if he can, can survive. Right. Right. Yeah, true. This is nice. Yeah, thanks. This is the same, same, same assignment. And, you know, I traveled 40 miles away because I heard a little something that uh, uh, that this is an actual U.S. Open trophy and it was on display. So, again, I had a blank canvas to do whatever I right, wanted. Right, to do. Right. But the display, oddly enough, was at a, uh, a park in Seattle. The tournament's in Tacoma. The, the thing is on display, I hear, in Seattle, in some park as part of, like, some effort to brand Seattle as the home of the U.S. Open, when really it was Tacoma, which is kind of the stepchild of Seattle. So <laughs> I just looked at my assistant, and I said, well, perfect, let's go. You know, let's go see what, what are they doing there. I mean, who knows? So literally it's, you know, on the other side of this, which I shot, okay, it's, it's like you could, you could walk up and get your picture taken with – you know, the U S open trophy. Fine. Great. Not interested. <laughs> you know, so, you know, we, I just literally walked around as the day was growing late and, you know, from the backside, I just waited for the elements to come together where people were kind of looking at the, at the trophy. And, and, uh, this was, they ended up, you know, they, the most of this, uh, spread was done online and, and, and consistently, uh, you know, they were just updating, uh, but then they did a magazine spread and I, 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 in the print publication, obviously. And then, uh, I believe this led the print, uh, spread. So yes. there's, there's two great lessons from that little story you just shared. Um, one, it's like when you're in a, when you're uh, working as, I don't care if you're just working as a photographer, but especially when you're working as a photojournalist, you kind of just gotta, you gotta follow these trails and see where they lead. So, oh, you're, you know, you're at the golf course in Tacoma, but you're going to drive up to Seattle to just see where this leads. And right. The second, thing, the second thing is really important, that idea that, so you literally walk to the other side of the canvas. Um, yeah. And the idea of just as a photographer, turning around and looking behind you, it's kind of the same thing. It's just. Right. <laughs> There's so many pictures behind you if you're at a football game, you're, if you're wherever right. you are, you're in pol shooting politics, turn around, just look. And, 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 and I really think that, you know, I had such a, you know, I, I always looked at so much photography, you know, and I, I, I would look at the magazines every week, you know, before they were all online and just, and, and 
you know, it gave me not, not to copy or emulate, but to really like, I, I love to look at good photography. Right. And I, and, and I, you know, I had a time, we all had a time where we could see that work being published. I think things have changed a bit now because again, even this is just four years ago and I had a blank slate for a week. And I, I just, you know, that frees me to say, well, <laughs> I'm out of Tacoma. Let's go see if I can find something. And and I know that it's not the end of my career. If I get to Seattle, it's like, okay, well, that was a bust. Let's go back to Tacoma. So I don't think that is as available as much anymore. So photographers, my belief is that they become so much more concerned with making sure that they get just that quintessentially standard go-to expected picture that the the idea of taking a risk a little bit has been eliminated and the best pictures i i think not that this was a huge risk but the best pictures come from taking that risk a little bit you know to 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 shun what everybody else is shooting and go look for something different the ironic thing is in a world where everybody has a camera and a way to publish that image every every standard shot every standard angle every um every view that's not uh doesn't just ne necessarily have like insight or another level to it all that's already been shot and shared 10 times yeah there's no reason not to take risks at this point because all the standard stuff's been scooped up and distributed already right i mean right. i just oh this is <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. I love politics. I love shooting politics, you know, because you take the gloves off. I don't care. I don't care right. what side of the fence you're on. Right. We're swinging. <laughs> That's it. And, you know, this was not photographically, even. Photographically, we're swinging. Yeah, of course. And, yeah, of course. Um, th this was not even. This was a discovery. This was like a, you know, are you freaking kidding me type of, like, moment. So this actually stems from all my immigration work. Um, looking for, you know, I've shot a lot of, a lot of stories on immigration, some self-assigned, some assigned. Um, but they run the gamut from profiles for the New York Times Magazine on a, on a Texas town to self-assigned work on vigilantes praying along the border. Um, and, and just looking for ways to expand on a topic that has always interested me. So as we came up to the 2016 election, more and more was being written, and I think that's key because, uh, to point out, or stop right there for a second, I think as a photojournalist, if you're not reading, and reading a lot, um, you're gonna be an ill-informed and not as good a photographer, I'm, I'm just sorry. I think that you're gonna find things to look for, you're gonna understand concepts and stories and so forth, so I was reading that there was a surge in people seeking citizenship out of concern for the direction that um, you know, politics were taking us uh, leading up to the election. So I had shot uh, immigration swearing in ceremonies, naturalization ceremonies going way back to 94 and, and before. So I reached out. Uh, it's a federal courtroom, so you have to get permission. I received permission. I go down to the convention center in Los Angeles where they're going to swear in like 10,000 of them. And um, it's much more restricted as to what I could do within the confines of the actual ceremony as opposed to when I had last shot it. It's, it's a hard, it's, I've, I've tried to shoot, those are hard to shoot. Yeah, I mean, you're pretty much told. It's hard to do them justice, I guess. Yes, absolutely. So I, as I shot, you know, and I did my best in there, I kind of just followed the flow of everybody kind of leaving. And the minute we exited, and the minute I exited, the, 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 the convention center was being held. I was just greeted with this mass mayhem of political screaming where on one side of, of the exit doors, you had the Republican Party and Republican advocates on one side and Democrats on the other. And they were literally screaming like, oh, have you registered to vote? How about you register with the party? Here's who, you know, and I was, I was literally like frozen from it. Like, what is this? And so I went back and visited it a few more times. And this was one of the pictures, obviously, you know, uh, I, I spoke briefly with these women. They didn't really want to give names or anything. Uh, yes, they're of the Muslim faith. And um, 
this picture just came together, I, you know, as, as well as I could have hoped at that, at that time, because uh, it was an, an important topic at that time. Um, and um, I mean, the short answer, yeah. the short answer, what you walked into was a gift. It's a photographer. It, <laughs> yeah. it, it was, it was, it was in, 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 and I remember thinking, geez, and I, I actually came home and I started looking, I hadn't seen anybody had really taken this angle. Um, and, and I reached out and was, uh, working with, 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 with Jeffrey and, and, and said, I'd like to go back. You want to, you know, kind of take a look and help me put some of this together. And, uh, you know, Jeff said, of course. And, and, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Smith at contact press image. Yes. Yes. And, uh, sorry, I should have said that. And he, uh, he, uh, I went back and we put this together and we put together a, a pretty solid set of images that kind of told this aspect to the story where the, it was a battle for voters and um, right. we could go around and, and, um, and uh, PRI ended up running a, a, a really nice spread, you know, and, and uh, that's so uh, funny. They, yeah. Yeah. They actually, they that's actually actually radio write the station. story. The radio station is running your pictures. <laughs> that was the funniest thing of all because, and, and I'll tell you, since we're going to talk, you know, complete frankness and reality here, we reached out to a lot of the traditional media powerhouses. Um, they showed interest or feigned interest or, you know, they, I'd like to say they showed legitimate interest. Um, virtually no one was willing to pay anything for the publication of the images. Yeah. And that's, um, that's, we, that's, we weren't willing to accept that. So we kept right. looking around and sure enough, you know, we came across uh, PRI has a big section that is devoted to immigration and, and, and other social, you know, initiatives and so forth. And, and uh, they offered a fee, and and um, and we went with it. So. Yeah. So there's two important things you said there. One, this idea. Now, I remember Rich Clarkson was talking about uh, Chris Johns, and this is like say, okay, back in the ancient days. Um, <laughs> and really. uh, so Chris, you know, National Geographic photographer, right. became their uh, managing editor eventually. But back then, he was a photographer and this is Rich Clarkson, who's a legendary director of photography. Um, you know, just every, I mean, he's National Geographic, uh, started the Topeka Capital Journal. Right, right. Just, you know, he's very influential. He's a very, very influential uh, director of photography. So he was, he was telling a story about how Chris Johns um, would research stories and get story ideas for National Geographic. And, He'd read the Wall Street Journal every day. The Wall Street Journal at that time didn't great use paper. photographs. Yeah. They yeah. used sketches or they right. used illustrations when they had to have like something other than type. They would use a, a, a gray uh, sketch of somebody, whatever illustration. Um, so this uh, award-winning photographer shooting for National Geographic at the highest level was using the Wall Street Journal to do story research and come up with ideas. And then the other thing you said, this, this whole thing with, uh, I don't know, have we lost the, the, the simple pleasure of looking at images? Are we so like just fire hosed down with images coming at us from every device and angle and TV screen that we can't just sit down and have a cup of coffee and page through a book and just enjoy these images and then study them. I don't know what your process is, but for me, it's always been like this image, this situation, how would I have approached it? Would I have done better? Would I have done worse? What did this photographer do that I, I can, I can, uh, I can, right. I can add to my toolbox. Uh, what did they think of that I wouldn't have? Th These are the thought processes that go into building up this craft that, you know, you hopefully, you know, like I said, toolbox that you have these, these tools to pull for them. I, I don't know if we have that anymore. Well, I think that's a personal choice. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more and I still do it. And I, I, you know, whether it's books or magazines or websites or wherever i mean I, I i will stop and just linger on photographs and just be stunned by them or or maybe even be appalled by some of them but whatever the case i will look at them and feel a capacity to like want to figure out 
how they did it, if there's something technically, or just like how did they get into that situation? How are they? How do they know to be in that spot right at the right, right timing? Right, like that. You know, that's what drives me to the point of, of, uh, yeah, just wanting to look over and over again. You know. You know, I caught a glimpse, of, glimpse of glimpse of this image. Let me try to move this. Whoops. What are you seeing on your screen? I'm seeing the overall photo mechanic uh, slides. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Don't worry. We don't edit on this podcast. <laughs> so I, just, I just wanted to move that uh, that window of our our smiling faces uh, so we could see this image. And so I uh, I kind of just looked at the contact sheet and the photo mechanic. Of, of these files you sent and this one immediately um this is something that you know it kind of harkens back to the first image of the father and son on the uh, border wall mm -hmm. there's something here that's happening that uh i don't know i don't know if people realize how many elements have to work to make a successful image. So I kind of outlined, you know, all those elements in the border fence of the father and right. son, what right. made that work. And when you, uh, when you eliminate the color factor, you kind of uh, reduce some of those requirements or some of those hoops you have to jump through. And this is a successful image that, uh, that wouldn't be as successful without the color. Um, mm -hmm but it also uh, completely nails the color. Everything comes together as a color image, which you had no control over. This isn't in a studio. This isn't, yeah. you didn't have uh, craft services here. Uh, you, it's, a, it's a found image that you recognized and captured as a photojournalist in color that uh, you know, completely works. And yeah. I think that's, uh, you know, if she if she goes with another uh, tone of lipstick, the image doesn't work. I mean, it's it's. I agree, I agree all all together wholeheartedly. Yeah, and that's what jumped out at me. I mean, I you know, so this is actually a very large protest in Los Angeles uh, in 2017 um, on a President's Day, um, and again sticking with you know some of the politics of of what was going on, but related to immigration. So I continue to find ways to you know be a part of what i you know something that's important to me as a as a, as a photographer as a photojournalist um and again it kind of almost also goes back to throwing another element to understanding you know what's going on so that you can try to make images that have some meaning to some degree as well so she's a young muslim woman and this was you know during that the protest was uh, primarily in relation to a proposed muslim ban so to speak uh, by the president. Um, so when I'm out trying to make images, you know, I, I think it's important to have an understanding so that you don't just come back with, you know, a group only of screaming, uh, you know, people with signs, um, which sometimes can fill the need or fill, fill the role of, of, of just standard stock photography. But, you know, I'm, you know, I have multiple roles. I, you know, yes, I need to license to provide, you know, uh, revenue for myself and my family. But, um, you know, I'm always out there trying to make the best, most important picture that I possibly can. And this, you know, I have a whole series, a, a, you know, a, a, a series of images from this woman, the young lady. Um, and this was really the one where it came together because I didn't really want uh, the image of her, you know, screaming in protest or anything. I, right. I just, this was a very quiet moment, which I've always been partial to, to be honest. I, I, I was just going to say, I'm so attracted to that calm and the, the, the storm, that eye of the hurricane. And you see those moments, and I'm always, as a photographer, attracted to them. So as a technical, you kind of hinted on this, and I was going to kind of uh, uh, get to this as well. This is your double truck. This is the image that works the best, but you also shot probably a double truck that would work on the other side of the page. You shot cover images. You shot images that work as a single page as, as opposed to a double truck. Tell me about that. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's key. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that, you know, I'm out there literally thinking in this type of environment, oh, make sure you, you get this picture and you get that picture. But um, at the same time, yes, as a, as a magazine photographer and understanding that this was not on assignment. So understanding uh, that the possibility of this being used in a publication, either as a two-page spread in a, pub, a print publication, which we call double truck, or a possible you know cover in in whatever publication or textbook or anything of that nature, um, I think it's important that that we provide different perspectives on things. So sometimes you know you're in tight, and sometimes you're backed off where you can, as you uh, referenced with with the father and son at the border. You know, yes, editors do love that kind of um, uh, empty space where they can drop some type in, perhaps, or or, or something to that effect. Um, and same with you know, same with you know covers and 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 going vertical and all that. So I really do shoot. Um, almost drawing back to the beginning of our conversation with the, a little bit of that newspaper mentality, which is to make sure like I'm providing an accurate uh, uh, and, and, and comprehensive look at whatever it is I'm shooting and whatever event I'm shooting, but while also getting in and telling it the way I want to tell it. So that comprehensive part means, okay, make sure you get something that they can use as a two page horizontal or, or, you know, make sure that you're shooting something good and, and, and tight for, for a, for a possible cover because yeah, I'd love to license it as a cover and, and, you know, bring in, you know, anywhere $1,500, dollars or something. So. Yeah. I just want to stress, I mean, this isn't, this isn't kowtowing to the, the editor at this point or the magazine or the publication. This is giving, uh, giving yourself options. You know, you find right. the image, but when you, when you lock on to a situation like this, as a photographer, as a photojournalist, you work it until it's no longer there. You have to, and if you don't, then it's, yeah. you know, you're failing yourself. Right. You really and, do. And just, you know, I don't want to be like the old guy here, but, well, I am the old guy here, but uh, you're, not shooting, you're not shooting it and then looking at the back of your camera. You are exhausting it. You are exhausting the situation in every way that you can imagine because you, you stumbled, a, by the grace of God, whatever you want to say, you stumbled yeah. into the perfect image possibility now your job is to work it until you can't think of another way to work it that's how that's how i approach and i yes. you know I, that just sounds. and you have to because he's, you know how fleeting these are they're right. going to be gone i mean you know other people move in in the background and then boom it's you know the, the you know you're going to get maybe 15 20 seconds if you're lucky you better you better work that situation you better work it and yeah. never ever think well, I'm going to go, there's something happening over here and then I'm going to come and back. I'll come back. First. Yeah. No, you, you yeah. work it. You work Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I love this. This is a nice moment. Thanks. Yeah. This is from, uh, that project that I was working on, 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 uh, on, uh, new Americans is what we called it. So, um, this was, this was actually after the election. So I continued to work on it, even though it had been published by PRI, uh, prior to the election. Um, but I wanted to continue, uh, because this this process has continued on with with immigrants um, uh, seeking citizenship at at record levels. So um, yeah, this was a something that I just saw. I, I really love their hand. You know, again, it's a quick fleeting moment. I have other images of this woman that I continued to work. Um, she's 103 years old. Um, that I from Vietnam, and I continued to work her. Uh, but this was really a very, very quick, this was really the only one that worked for me. Well, I just, I mean, this is, this is one of those images that is like, okay, this is like the low hanging fruit. This is the gift. If, yeah. if you don't make this image, you just yep. you be in the room. This is just, it's, it's there. You right. got it. And, yep. you know, yeah. and we, as photographers, we can't really always take credit for being brilliant, but this is... No, no, no. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is this is there for you to see, and if you don't see it, um, then shame on you. You know, the, technically speaking, it doesn't take much to, to really get this image, but, uh, you know, make sure you see it. Make sure that you're aligned so that when the time right, comes, right, right. you know, she's going to place her hand right, on her right, heart right. and you're ready to go. You know, yeah. not be, oh, I didn't know they were going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Or, <laughs> right. I didn't read the Wall Street Journal. I don't know... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's going to happen. 
too. Where is this? Uh, this is uh, this is the migrants down at the border. Just right. this uh, re recent surge at the end of last year. Um, I have a client that had me uh, go down there and spend some time. And um, uh, th this was when it was kind of you know nothing was really set up in Tijuana as far as where the migrants were supposed to go. So they were being kind of uh, pushed into various parks and, you know, makeshift camps and so forth and so on. So, um, this was just, this was a very, unfortunately, you know, a, well, I shouldn't say that cause that's very actually, um, uh, <laughs> selfish for me to say, I was going to say, unfortunately, she really kind of, you know, moved herself purposely out of the frame and, and away from me. Um, I, I would have liked to have worked this even a little bit more, but I feel like I captured what I wanted from the facial expression right. of this very young mother waiting to hopefully get uh, her name called so that right. she could meet with an asylum officer. Um, this was actually placed, Jeffrey Smith uh, was successfully placed this uh, with the New York Times book review for a story that they had written. Nice. Uh, yeah. I mean, so. that you know, this is one of those moments where, uh, as a, you know, I hate to go get, uh, get into the, uh, get into the technical aspects and not technical, but the, I don't know, working aspects of what a photojournalist does. And this is one of those situations where the image is the, the possibility is so good that you have to be careful. You don't want to like, muddy the water or spook them or any you just got to work it so slowly and you and and then it and then like you said she moves away and it's gone and so it's just one of those delicate situations besides that i think and this has always been on probably not always but at some point when i started deeply thinking about this kind of stuff uh, this is one of those images where, as a photojournalist, you should be making images that uh, that invite the viewer to to see just step into that your subject's shoes for thirty seconds, ten seconds, whatever it takes to look at that image. And this is this is one of those images. And I know it's you know it wasn't uh, you wanted to work it, you wanted it, but. But a viewer, man, woman, uh, husband, wife, with a child or without a child, they can look at this image and they can put themselves in the place of this woman uh, holding her child. And so that's a successful image. Thanks. Okay. Same, same situation here, Ken. Um, and, and so to draw what you just said, I think it's so key, which is like, uh, you know, you want to put yourself in this situation. You got to work yourself into some of these situations. This was already, you know, there, the international media was all over this. You know I mean? Everybody, if every... Everybody's stomping all over it. Everybody's I know. Everybody's stomping just, all over. We've right. been in those situations and, and it's, it's difficult to be in those because on, on every level, every photojournalist uh, you know, has empathy for their subjects. Uh, you know, any photojournalist that has a, uh, an ounce of a heart, you know, has empathy and they, they don't want to ever do inflict any damage on to their subject, psychologically, emotionally, anything. So, you know, you have to tread lightly, but, you know, you also need to capture images that are, that are, that go beyond just, you know, that standard point picture. So I think, like and all of my colleagues, you know, and, and yourself and everybody else, you know, we're after pictures that can kind of tug at the emotional strings. That last image with the young mother, I think, was, was uh, you know, did uh, to some degree. Um, the chaos of this one to some degree with the very, very brief. I mean, I have, this is really the only frame where it, it, I kind of capture that, that moment of like, uh, this is just, you know, because then immediately, you know, his hands come up. And so you have to be, again, you have to kind of be in that situation. You can see that I'm working with a, with a, you know, in close proximity to these people. Um, so you have to carry yourself as a photographer when you're making these pictures. Um, and I know so many of my colleagues know this, so if they're listening or they're seeing this, they, 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 they know, I don't need to explain it to them, but, but you have to be ready to take, get that picture. So you have to be there in that situation and, and and um and, and hopefully capture something that, that 
that gets it across, you know. It's kind of it's kind of one of those images that uh unfortunately uh say like since the birth of modern day photojournalism, say World War II, it's one of those images that we've seen time and time again in the twentieth century and now the twenty first century where it's displaced people whether it's like hurricane katrina or whatever it is this is like it's almost a mem at this point it's just this is just the world we live in Uh, and that's unfortunate isn't it it's sad and we've all covered those you know i mean and you get tired you almost get tired of covering it from the perspective of like geez does this really have to happen to all these people again whether it's katrina or it's Rwanda or it's <laughs> Kosovo. It's just, it's just, it's just constant. It's, it's constant. It's constant, you know? Oh, and that's what, Sal, that's what Salgado was after with migrations. I mean, right, you know, right. I mean, it's been constant for so long, you know? Right. So I, I just, I, I just realized this was, this is probably in uh, Arizona, but <laughs> first I thought it was Rwanda. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. Rhodesia, the poor, the no. Rhodesia. It, it, it has that feel of the African uh, bush and the, the, the floppy bush hats. And yeah. it's got kind of even that 1970s Rhodesia color to it. <laughs> Doesn't it? I mean, it does to some degree. Yeah, but it's chromes. <laughs> um, let me ask you why Arizona? Uh, I think I hung out with these same guys uh, down in, boy. South uh, Tombstone, whatever. Yeah, Tombstone, Douglas. Yeah. What county is that? What that 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 uh, military? Yeah, it's down by Nova. It's it's Tombstone and Douglas. I did those same people yeah. down there for yeah. Newsweek. <laughs> yeah, I know these guys. Yeah, no, these, these no, this is actually in eastern San Diego County. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so this is actually very early on. So, uh, you know, if I could just this is I. I I wanted to have this image shown for a couple reasons, not so much because it's an aesthetically amazing, beautiful image. Um, it's actually the result. It's an important image, number one. And, and more importantly than that, for our talk here, it kind of speaks to like what we do as photojournalists. So real quickly, in 94, when I first started to spend time down there, the, uh, down along the U.S.-Mexico border, um, one of the the biggest stories in the country was what was called Operation Gatekeeper. And it was a Clinton administration's attempt to shut down um, undocumented immigration. Um, and they did this big dog and pony show where they, you know, wheeled out all the border patrol and they had the, all the international press down along uh, very close to where our first picture was at in Friendship Park and said, we're shutting down the border. And, um, you know, okay, sure. So, um, just by obvious, you know, common sense, I decided to venture on my own uh, about 70 miles east uh, from the border, uh, along the border, but 70 miles east from, from that area of Imperial Beach where everybody was concentrating their work. And um, I literally went into a small town, found a town hall meeting that was going on, and it was about immigration. I think I took maybe three pictures at that meeting, but I talked to some people and I said, this is what I was doing. And I said, I'm trying to show the impact that undocumented immigration is having along people on both sides of the border. And um, one gentleman specifically said, oh, well, well, you need to talk to Bob. And I said, okay, who's Bob? And he says, well, I'll introduce you. So he goes and finds a gentleman and he brings him over. And he says, this, this is a star for, and he's looking to, you know, he's looking to, uh, you know, do some work along the border. You know, I thought he should talk to you. And Bob was just super kind gentleman. He said, what are you doing? And I explained. And um, I said, oh, this is uh, on my own. I'm not on assignment at this point. I just really want to try to get a real understanding. He says, well, why don't you come out next weekend to my place and I'll show you what's going on. Well, I'm already at this point, 220 miles from home. I said, that's fine. No problem. So went home. The following weekend went, you know, 300 plus miles out to this guy's. He lives on the border. His family has lived literally on the border um, their entire lives. I pull up to the gate. His wife comes out, says, can I help you? Dogs are barking. You know, this is rural. And I explained who it was. And she says, oh, yeah, I think he's expecting you. So she calls, calls out on this little walkie-talkie radio. 
He comes bouncing up in his truck, a couple of rifles in the window, and he says, uh, oh, hey, it's good to see you. Yeah, jump in. We're, we're chasing some. And I said, okay. I, I really have no idea what to expect. You have no idea what you're getting. I got no, no idea. So we get in, I get in the, in the truck, and, and, and we go bouncing down through these dirt roads, and, and we stop all of a sudden. I'm looking out, and I, and I kid you not, Ken, the brush stands up. <laughs> <laughs> it was three guys in ghillie suits yeah. with brush on their heads with assault rifles camoed out. And Bob starts talking to them and says, so they had been chasing a group of undocumented immigrants. Okay. So I, you know, not shit myself. <laughs> sorry, sorry for the language, but um, anyways, to, to, to cut to the end of the story, um, I asked if I could continue to come out. And for over the course of a year, I went out there as often as I could, stayed all weekend, and I just documented what they were doing. And um, this is up until this point, to our best knowledge, and Ann Stack at Black Star and I, you know, took this immediately first to Kathy Ryan at the New York Times Sunday Magazine. No one else had produced this, this, this vigilante type story along the US Mexico border. And it was, you know, it's pretty solid. I mean, we, you know, it was, it was a solid, it was a solid story. It was, it was well told, I think, as far as comprehensiveness about what was going on and fairness and so forth. And, uh, and we placed it with the New York Times Sunday Magazine. And, and after that, um, uh, you know, other things came to me from various publications asking me to go document this along the border or that along the border. Uh, so just to be clear, this, this image was published in the New York Times Magazine? I, I, I can't remember if this exact one was. They ended up running a, uh, I don't believe it was this one. I believe it was a guy on the left where he's actually standing to the right with his assault rifle. And then there's a few of them on the ground as the left that was the lead. And then a couple of other, it ran over the course of uh, one page and then a double truck. And then I think the back page, so these are three pages or four pages in, in uh, 90, Eight or something like that, two ninety nine maybe. Cool. I mean, I was just you know expecting this for you to say this. Oh, this has never been published. I wanted to show it here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. It wouldn't I don't surprise sure me. It wouldn't surprise me. It, I'm not sure it's been published in print, but but um, a version of this, not this exact frame, I don't believe uh, was published. Okay, so this is more of uh, the. Uh, other side of things? <laughs> well, it's the other side of things, but it, photographically, it's almost like things that you can actually get paid for today. Yeah, and you know, I, I guess, you know, I, I, how do you sum up like some of what you've done and just, you know, maybe a dozen pictures or something, but I, I guess I wanted to show that um, in, it really kind of comes back in full circle with what you were saying about starting with the newspapers. So in the newspapers, you know, that first newspaper I worked at, man, you're going to shoot a portrait at 10 a.m. You're going to shoot wild art at 11 a.m. You're going to shoot a sports event. You're going to shoot the pet of the week. You're going to shoot, you know, you got to learn how to do everything. And, and, and as I continue to do that, you know, at the Hartford Current, you know, and then on the contract at the LA Times, um, and then into the publications and being guided by really good people, you know, my agency reps. And then when I went over to Aurora in the late 90s and working with Jose Azell and a lot of other really good people, listen, the more skills you have, the bottom line is I want to be producing important work, but I'm also, you know, I've just celebrated our 30th anniversary. You know, I have a son in grad school and, you know, a mortgage to pay. You know, if somebody asked me to light something, and it's a good day raid or you know, good publication, so forth. I I would love to say yes and be able to do it. So this is the other side of being that freelance photojournalist. I think is important, you know. And and this was first sports. It's a great point. It's a great point. This uh, um, <laughs> everybody's always telling you to specialize, specialize, specialize. And I was just like, no, no, I'm not, I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to just like shoot one thing. I want to shoot everything, uh, sports, whatever, you know, news, yeah. politics, color, black and white. Uh, I never wanted to specialize. And I think that, you know, um, we're photographers first. We do journalism. Um, but we don't, 
you don't want to get pigeonholed, I guess is what I'm saying. No, I think that can be a, a real trap. And this story, actually, this was part of a broader story for Sports Illustrated on fox hunting in America. So I actually went out with these people. They hunt coyote because <laughs> there's no fox in California. So we were hunting, and I spent days with them. In fact, the rider and I beat the hell out of this rental 4x4 trying to keep up with these people on horses. Sure. <laughs> I destroyed this thing. So, yeah. um, but Well, the best, the best, the best uh, all-terrain vehicle is a rental vehicle. Just yes, always, right? <laughs> especially when you can't ride horses. So um, this, was a, uh, this was a collaboration with the editors at SI when you know, I said, you know, listen, you know, I don't feel like I have that kind of like opening shot. You know, you want to try to, you want to try to put together a, 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 a lit portrait that, yeah, you know, maybe we can open with. And they said, sure, we'll give you another day. You know, let's try to set that up. So we did. And it wasn't even meant to be lit. You know, be prepared when you go out on a shoot. This was, they, they showed up like two hours late. This was, I had scouted this location close to where they kennel their dogs oh, and the horses. Right. And it was beautiful lighting at the time that I had right, set it up right. at like 7.30 in the morning, you know, right. because I got dealing with dogs. So you don't want lights and horses and blah, blah, blah. But I brought a generator with some lights and so forth. And then they were late. We just had to like, you know, we had to improvise. Be prepared. Yeah. So um, thank you for sharing those images. I was well, just thanks. thinking about this uh, image. It's, I mean, it's so good. That, thank you. Uh, Shepherd Ferry could steal it and really not have to do much. <laughs> am, I, am I wrong? No. <laughs> I don't know whether to take. yeah, it does. Uh, I'll take it as a compliment, but I hope he doesn't steal it. <laughs> no, I, he's, got, he's got one of these. It's so similar to that. Um, yeah, 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 that's funny. Uh, actually, I have I actually own the print, so I can't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fine. So... Let's, uh, so that's a good segue. Part of, uh, part of your evolution as a photographer, you, you mentioned it before, what exactly is a work for hire contract? Yeah. Um, you know, that is the evolution we've all been through, Ken, you know, you, you as freelancers, you know, we, 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 we have to make a living. So, you know, things change and that's, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be so resistant that we can't evolve because if you don't, if you show so much resistance, you don't evolve, you become extinct. So, but at the same time, there has to be, I think for me, there has to be a certain threshold and there's, you know, work for hire contract is, is pretty simple. There's two types. One, you're an employee that's actually considered work for hire by its definition. You're an employee. So as an employee, man, you get, you know, your benefits, you know, your check's going to drop every two weeks. Um, you know, you have a health plan hopefully, and maybe even, you know, a benefit package including retirement so forth and so on great that's a true vehicle, a vehicle to drive cameras a vehicle to drive you don't have to you know the, the the new nikon shows up the new sony the new canon you know the department handles it they tell you to come by and pick out your gear or let them know what you need and all that's taken care of no money out of your pocket that's terrific what you don't have as an employee is the ownership of your work your employer owns it fair trade-off most would say as a freelancer, you do not get anybody giving you gear. You have to purchase it. You do not have anybody giving you 401k benefits. You do not have anybody giving you health benefits. There is no guarantee whatsoever that your next check is ever going to drop. What you do have is the ownership of your images. If hopefully you're a good enough photographer and you put some things in place, you can use that to create revenue. Um, by licensing to publications that are interested in immigration and so forth and so on. Photographers have been doing this for a long time. The work for hire contract that becomes the real issue is when you are not an employee, but the company that wants to hire you as a freelancer drops this work for hire contract in front of you and says, now, you're not an employee and we're not going to guarantee you anything. We might not ever call you again and you might not ever get another check from us again and so forth and so on, but we are going to own your images if you shoot. So now you don't own your images and you have no guarantee of ever having any work again. And it's just not something that I feel is uh, ever going to be conducive to um, running a successful freelance uh, career. Unless you're on a trust fund. If you really, it makes no difference if you ever make money, then, you know, that's out of the equation. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know people like that. So, 
um, you know. Well, so you and I, you and I have uh, had this conversation, not necessarily with each other, but dozens and dozens of other people online over the last probably 10, 12 years. And the next thing they would say is, well, this is the contract they're offering me. And this is a big corporation. I can't, I'm just one little photographer. I can't fight against them. Well, um, you know, <laughs> I don't, you know, it, the bottom line is you have to make a decision on what's best for you. Those that depend on you, um, and so forth and so on. I don't know any business model and I would present this uh, question to anybody who makes that statement that like, well, this is a contract, so I have to sign it. If you go present that type of argument to, you know, uh, the, any, you know, Wharton school of business or something, literally in a business one-on-one class and say, listen, you know, here's how I plan on doing business. I'm going to have no guarantee of any work and I'm not going to own the intellectual property that I create. I, I think you're going to have professors look at you with a really wide eyed, well, how do you expect to make a living then? Okay, so the bottom line is as freelancers, which most of our professional industry now is freelance, um, you will have to be make that choice. Do you feel that if you work for a, 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 a work for hire contract like the Associated Press provides their freelancers or the New York Times provides their freelancers or Condé Nast provides, provides provides to their freelancers and just so many others will are you going to gain something so exponentially that it overcomes the fact that you can never earn licensing revenue from from having given up the rights to your work or you know what what's the situation so you i never tell people don't sign or to do sign it i tell them what i tell my son man there's a pros column and there's a cons column you're gonna have to see which one outweighs one another Okay, but I can guarantee you if you fall for the, well, we can't guarantee you any work, but we'll probably use you again. So if you just sign this, you know, you'll do it. Um, it, it usually doesn't work out too well. I mean, we all, both of us, we've heard the nightmare stories. People sign the contracts. They pull up their roots, like, uh, unlike you, they who moved from California to New Hampshire or whatever, they didn't have any guarantees. They didn't. And they, so they, they, they move from, from one place to another and they sign the contract and then the phone never rings. The, the promises are, are vacant. And, you know, for a variety of reasons, one, the editors leave. Sure. So maybe whatever editor was convincing you, like, listen, if you do this, I'm going to call you. Great. They up and leave and they go to a different place. And now you have somebody else that has a different Rolodex, so to speak, you know, a different group of photographers that they want to call. So suddenly the phone, that's very common. I mean, that's, that's common. So you need, you need to, you know, really look at it from the most truest perspective, in my opinion, which is if they're going to guarantee you, and I, I'm speaking to the choir here because I know that many of my friends back when the contracts were offering contracts, back when the magazines were offering contracts, would be guaranteed 50, 100 days a year, um, you'd still own your work. But I'm, I'm, let, me, let, me, let me just say, if the New York Times or any other publication, Associated Press says, listen, in exchange for the work for hire, I'm going to guarantee you in writing here 100 days a year, then I would implore especially younger photographers looking to really kickstart their career, but also actually be able to pay the rent. That might not be a bad deal for you. Okay. Look at it a little harder. So just, just but those don't exist. Okay. No one's doing them. No one offers us. Why, why don't they? I mean, okay. So just to backtrack, a magazine contract or even a newspaper contract, the wires actually had a few contracts like that, which would guarantee a photographer a certain amount of work each year at, at a standard day rate and the photographer more often than not 95% of the time would own the copyright of their work and be able to profit off that work at a future date. So right. that was the industry industry standard um, ever since, uh, you know, Elliot Erwitt right. uh, fought this fight for all of us back in the 1950s with life. Right. And, you know, nobody, 
I mean, he fought a big corporation. Somehow it worked. He got blackballed out of the deal, but yeah, he did. The rest of, yeah. us, the rest of us benefited. Um, so why don't those contracts exist anymore? You know, one, I think it's the, the, the publications and wire service, so forth. They, they understand they don't have to offer that. I mean, why don't, so, why don't they have to offer it? Well, because there's just such a pool of photographers out there that are willing to um, acquiesce to these demands that are so one sided that why offer something if it's not necessary? So, um, you know, we, can, we can't really go back in time, but we do know that, uh, and much of it has been talked about online, that photographers can be their own worst enemy. And, and you know, when you agree to these terms, um, you know, it, it's, it's not going to help it down the road. You're going to, you're not, there's never a contract that comes along that gets better the next time. It almost always, once you give away something, it's not going to be put back in. It's going to, they're going to keep nibbling away. I've seen that, you know, just far too many times to, to talk about. But I don't think these publications feel any need to guarantee anything to a freelancer because if you don't sign that contract, they're going to tell you, okay, we'll go to somebody else, which is what a lot of photographers say to me. Well, they'll go to somebody else if I don't sign it. I said, okay, we'll go find a, go find a client that doesn't offer you a work for hire contract. What's so, I mean, New York Times, a wire service, whoever, any, and name any publication. I mean, what's the end game for these photographers that they'll sign away their work? I, I can't even imagine letting someone else own my work. I've never even, uh, I mean, even with Time Magazine. Right. Time Magazine was a bit of a stickler when it came to their cover images. Uh, right. And wanting to own the copyright, and I never, I never even, I mean, I got pulled back into the, you know, the, 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 the whipping shed a couple times on that, and I refused. Yeah, still a sign, you know, I mean, whatever. But uh, to what, what's the draw? What's the end game? What, what do you hope to accomplish by signing a contract that's gonna, um, you know, you get to shoot a, a hearing on Capitol Hill? And next week, the phone might not ring. And a year from now, if you happen to shoot, I don't know, say the Anita Hill hearings, that's going to be published for the rest of history. Um, Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas, you know, um, you can't even, you can't even like use that for your own book because you don't own the copyright. What's the end game? Why, why? I don't, I, you know, I, the end, I think, and I, in my workshop, I show a lot of contracts, like the legitimate real contracts, where some will just blow your mind. They specifically prohibit you even displaying the image in your home. In your home, you're not allowed to. It's in the contract. Um, so, you know, some of them are mind boggling. What I think the end game for a lot of photographers is they think, particularly when it's a name brand entity media company that's hiring them, is that this is a door. And I, under, you know, I understand their thinking to some degree. I have a 23-year-old son who's kickstarting his own career, not, not in journalism, and he's looking for networking opportunities and to build out his internships and to really find his way into his profession. I understand that. But, you know, if you're looking to go to work right off the bat, again, drawing it back full circle to what we first started this conversation about going to work for a small newspaper or something, if, you, if you're so inclined that you're going to graduate and right away, man, you want to freelance for the New York Times or you want to freelance for AP or you want to freelance for Getty or you want to freelance for pick any well-known Sports Illustrated or Time or anybody, you might be better off developing your, your uh, ability to make great pictures, develop your look and so forth by going to a smaller, not well-known uh, local publication, website, whatever the case might be, uh, that doesn't offer those terms, and, and, and build your, 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 your ability to produce great images and make great images. We all know great images do not have to be made on Capitol Hill. They do not have to be made at the World Series. You know, I mean, they just don't, you know. I mean, look at Pat, excuse me, Pat Crow's work from Delaware. You know, uh, that was worked way back in the day that just blew me away. It was a tiny little town and a tiny little community that he was just consistently producing 
just beautiful, beautiful community-based photojournalism. So I think some of the draw for the photographers tends to be like, well, this is how I develop my name. I, well, I would necessarily no, there's, I'm just saying there's no, uh, what, so what do you do? You, you, you keep working for the New York Times? You think you're gonna what, shoot, uh, shoot for Nike next? I don't, I, don't, I just, I'm, for the I'm not sure, I'm not sure a lot of them think that far through. Um, and I don't mean that in any way disparagingly. I just think that it tends to be, oh, here's an opportunity here. And it's with a big name, pick any name. Um, I have to take it. And they don't really give consideration to what that contract says and what it really means. And I, you know, I've had those people countless times in my course and talking about why well, I didn't really understand what that work for hire meant. And in the long run, they may not think perhaps, and, 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 and I should say, put an asterisk on this, that it's not just young photographers. I've, I've had more than a few veteran photographers that have been transitioned out of their staff positions into freelance jobs that so readily hire and so, re I mean, so readily sign these contracts because they have no real appreciation for the fact that 20 years from now, if you, if you own that work, not only can you create licensing revenue, which is why, by the way, why these media companies want to own your work. Why do they want to own your work? Because they know they're going to keep using it or they're going to pass it off to subsidiaries or they themselves are going to license it. It's built into the terms of the contract. It specifically gives them those rights. So, in, you know, I think a lot of these photographers just don't want to consider it or they think it's the road to um, exposure. And that exposure will lead to, yes, being discovered by, you know, the next you know, Nike or whatever. And it, it's just so rare that something like that would happen. You know, it really is. It just doesn't happen too often. <laughs> I guess I'll just, I'll just state for the record here, not, you know, it's, I don't know exactly how to humble brag. So I'll just brag. I've never yeah. signed a piece of paper with the New York times. I've done, you know, whatever with the magazine or anybody else. A week ago, right. I had a front page picture in the New York times, never mm -hmm. signed anything with them. Right. That's there's a, what, a, right. So, you know, now I, I, here's a, here's a counter argument to that, that I know I would hear from a young photographer where you're Ken Dresky. You can, you can do that. Yeah, I'm a bad motherfucker. That's <laughs> my wallet. Yeah. But you know, there, there are actually ways to do that. Now, you know, you can push back and try to create a more manageable contract. And some people are going to tell you, no, I've discovered that. I, I mean, countless times countless times and then i've discovered countless times also that they are willing to like change a little bit of of the wording and and let you retain the rights to your work because oftentimes as we know in fact not even oftentimes almost all the time the contracts that are being presented to you by photo editors or the director or whoever's given the creative director is given they have nothing to do with it except pass it along to you they're being written by lawyers Right. So, you know, perhaps they can be negotiated, but, you know, I, I look at it when I talk to younger photographers, even veteran, I had a talk with a longtime Pulitzer Prize winning photographer the other day on the phone who needed some information on licensing. He was a former staffer um, and he just didn't understand the licensing. So we were talking about these things. The, the idea is, it, you know, <laughs> there's a long play at this. You, you know, if you only approach it as a short-term play, well, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll take it while the assignments are good. But especially if you're 30 years old, okay, where are you going to be at 50, at 55? Because that sneaks up on you really quickly, Yeah. you know? I mean, really quickly. So what are you going to have? I mean, I'll, really... be, I'll be 55 in just like under 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Yeah, what, yeah what, myself. What, 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 I mean, not that you know you didn't predict this, but what what happened at Sports Illustrated? This whatever is it? Sports Illustrated? I don't know what it is, but what happened at the yeah. formerly great sports magazine? Yeah, known as sports and, you know, I don't even want to say I predicted it because I don't want it to sound like I was like okay, you know, oh, I was you know I I knew all along, man. It was written on the wall, and and I think that's part of the problem. 
too many people try to uh, stick their head in the sand and pretend like we don't have issues that we have to deal with. And if you're will, if if you're if you're going to be a part of that, then you you really are part of the problem. So with Sports Illustrated, what happened in 2016, although it began in 2015 when they gave us the new contract, was um, there was a new contract which they asked uh, all the photographers to sign. So uh, in in late 2015, long story short. Um, those of us that have contributed to the magazine for a significant period of time received the first version of it with, um, you know, kind of that, uh, hey, this is all good, you know, please sign this, you know, please get it back to us as soon as possible, blah, 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 blah. Well, when you looked at it, it was as different from the previous uh, contract as you could ever find. There was all sorts of verbiage, wording that was, I had not seen in a contract to this point, it was about brand use and associated brands and affiliated brands and all this brand, brand, brand. And then in a nutshell, it was a massive rights grab. You retain the copyright most of the time, depending on what you're shooting, uh, but it was a massive rights grab by which uh, any additional licensing revenue, which we would all make from Sports Illustrated assignments, um, was virtually going to be stripped. So let me give you a, a, a simple, simple example. You go do a shoot for Sports Illustrated, they run into the magazine, and Sports Illustrated for kids decides to pick up a part of the story and they run it, you would get money for it. Uh, the year ending, year in pictures, or, you know, let's football. Just, let's, let's just back up and let's just, so, Normally, with Sports Illustrated, any of the Time Life magazines, any of the magazines, you'd work for a day rate. Right. And so the, let's say the day rate was $500. Right. That was against a page rate. And the page rate, let's just say that was $500. dollars right. If you got more than one page in the magazine or a cover, if you got a double truck, two pages. You got more money. $1,000. So you get right. an extra $500. Right. Right. If it's picked up by Sports Illustrated for kids, more money. More money. Right. If it's used in the year end edition, more money. Now, the first right. meeting I had with Sports Illustrated was, not, you know, I was 16. I didn't know, well, no, I was like, well, I was 17. I don't know, whatever. I was, I was older than Neil Lifer when right. he his first, I mean, the guy was 15 when he was 15, right, right. So, 15, 16. But, Anyways, Barbara Hinkle was the director of photography at the time. And one of my favorite sports illustrators, I, I was just, this guy was the amazing, Andy Haight. Um, yeah, of course. So good. It's incredible work. And she shared with me, you know, the reason she let me in her office, because, you know, I was like this kid from Nebraska, literally coming into her. So she had to give me, and I ended up, you know, spending a lot of, she told me so much valuable information she shared with me. But one of the things she shared, like the contracts for Sports Illustrated, the day rate was like three twenty-five, and the contract was like for a hundred days. So um, you're making like thirty grand a year as a contract photographer for Sports right. Illustrated. This is back in the early 1980s. Yeah, and um, she said Andy usually makes about three times that a year with sales right licensing i should say so he was making say his base was 32 grand from sports illustrated all his expenses is paid or are, are paid for. all right. his film is paid for he was making another 90 to 100 grand on top of that in the 1980s that's a lot of money 130 grand when you can buy a nikon f3 for 325 right grand. right and all that, you know, so all that is was 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 not changed in that one iteration of the 2016 contract, but slowly that changed over time, as we know. And it eventually got to that point where all of that was going to be gone with this 2016 contract, virtually all of it. I mean, any reuse of your images with anything that was affiliated with with Sports Illustrated would render it 
royalty free. So they could use it in anything that had the logo, trademark, or name of Sports Illustrated. And it could go on to their affiliates and partners and its signees and so forth. So it was going to be a significant drop in, in uh, revenue for everybody that was contributing to the magazine. Um, well, say, let's just say a hypothetical. Say you make that picture of uh, uh, Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. No, say like Indomitian Sue runs back a fumble for a touchdown last weekend. Yeah. Right. And whatever shoe company he works for wants to license that image for a poster. Right. And Domican's going to get paid. Sports Illustrated is going to get paid. The person that prints the poster is going to get paid. The, the, the magazine that runs the advertisement of that poster is going to get paid. What's the photographer get paid? In that situation, it's actually a little trickier than that, Ken, because um, that would be a, considered a commercial use. And <laughs> well, let's switch it back to, so a lot of the commercial use rights are locked up by Getty and AP and so forth and so on. So the reality of it is, and I'll, and I'll, I'll oh, switch. Right, 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 because that's NFL. The NFL has right. deals, right. But, but And not just NFL, but pretty much every major. Every, yeah every major sport so that that literally happened to me where i lost what was told to me would be at least ten thousand dollars on a shoot that i'd done for sports illustrated on an lpga championship and i had a, a quintessential picture of the young lady jumping in the in the water that was the iconic picture for that tournament uh the next day rolex had sponsored the woman lorena choa wanted the image called sports illustrated the editor miriam called me and said oh it looks like you're going to get the titleist full page ad and that's going to be like 10 grand and i said wow fantastic because you know great that's going to be extra money and then got a call back later that that was the first year i believe because Miriam had, had forgotten um, just because it had just been instituted that Getty had locked up the rights to the commercial use, any commercial licensing. So uh, Rolex had to go to Getty first. And if they literally could not find that image at Getty or something similar, um, then they could come back to Sports Illustrated. Uh, but they, they found something similar because everybody shoots that picture. So, okay. but, but, but related to the contract, things changed to the point where you you were basically just losing all control of your work, all control of your work and all licensing revenue. And the vast majority of freelancers that had worked with uh, Sports Illustrated up until that point refused to sign. We had a large pool of people that we pooled our money together. We hired a very uh, well-known and respected attorney in, in New York um, to negotiate that contract, uh, not only on our behalf, but for everybody, so that whoever signed this contract, was it was much more fair. We received a couple of uh, uh, concessions, so to speak, more on the minor side as we continued to push. Uh, then there was kind of some epic uh, caving in <laughs> right. by some photographers um, that uh, saw probably that like they were going to be losing out on, on work. They had a lot of eggs in one basket. Um, they ended up uh, agreeing to the to the contract and pretty much at that point the negotiations stopped and it became a sign this or you know thank you very much and 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 I, I want to be fair and say none of it was rude none of it was a, any sort of rude negotiations or anything uh, or 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 you know unfriendly it's business and and um, it just was not a fair contract so I walked away from it. you know and it, it wasn't like I was walking away from a hundred days a year let's be real Sports Illustrated and the magazines have been in rapid decline for a decade. So my whole point that I was very vocal about was why do you guys, those that are thinking of signing, why would you want to sign it when you're, it, it's, it's on a downhill path, guys. And if you look at this verbiage, if you look at the wording, they're getting ready to sell this. You can tell that what they're trying to sell is the archive. What they have the rights to is what is actually actually the valuable asset and now we see today as of yesterday the final sale has gone through so sports illustrated was sold as as you know with other magazines to meredith meredith never intended to keep it they made that very clear 
They kept it for less than two years, I think. Sold it off to Authentic Brands. It's a licensing and brand leveraging company. Immediately, and I tweeted this out in a thread today, immediately, you know, the New York Times and Variety and others wrote stories about the quote in the uh, CEO is saying, look, we, we want to we want to leverage the photo archive, among other things, literally mention the photo archive. They want to build Sports Illustrated affiliated or themed sports clinics and uh, e-sports sites and all these things. So anybody who signed that contract, it's now with a brand marketing company. They have the rights to use that. Because the terms in the contract said all of the terms go forward to any sale. So, you know, it's just, it's a bad situation. We saw this coming. Many of us saw it coming and it actually happened almost exactly as we thought it would. And it's unfortunate. So uh, allow me to sum this up. Basically, the, uh, the content, the product that we'd been producing as photographers that uh, many photographers thought was worthless. Many uh, industry in, in, insiders said it was worthless is basically the most valuable commodity that Sports Illustrated has today. That, that is succinctly as you can put it is 100% spot on. That's it. That's what they sold. Sports Illustrated was selling their most lucrative asset, which was the rights to the archive and their brand name, the Sports Illustrated swimsuit and, and all those types of things. But before they do it, it's important that you look at like how these things are done in retrospect. We, some of us saw it, <laughs> frankly, up front because it wasn't hard to see, but, but they were lining up to make sure that they got the rights they needed with that new contract. And then the dangling of, oh, you know, here, if you sign this, we'll get you work. And a lot of people that had never worked for Sports Illustrated before, before that bad contract. And then a bunch of us didn't sign it. And then all these new people swooped in and signed it. So what did they get out of it in two years? One assignment? Two assignments? What came of it? I can tell you virtually nothing because the magazine cut down to every other week. They were bare, they had like one editor in the office that was assigning work. There was, there was nothing there. So why would you assign the way the rights to your work for like a couple of assignments? What if you got a really important, <laughs> really important image that might actually you would like to control? And not incidentally, Ken, not just for revenue, but we should be able to control our work so that we have, those that have created it, the rights to say where it can be placed and can't be placed, especially when we're talking about more sensitive issues that are in politics or social, social issues. You know, that's an important point. No, it's a huge point and it's, uh, it's a moral question that I don't understand how pe I just don't get it. So Sports Illustrated for all practical purposes does, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, ESPN, the magazine, doesn't exist anymore, although I did see the body issue on the stands. This, right. um, you know, got to shake that money maker. Um, what's up with, have you, have you, have you this, this, uh, this online only site that, that goes by subscriptions and uh, the athletic, the athletic have, you, have you had a chance to look at their contract? I have. It's, um, you know, I, I'll just be honest with you. I mean, I'd, I'd love to say it's a good contract. It's deplorable. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's a pathetic rate. It's a rights grab. And they're just, it's really almost the same. It, the way I look at it is until Vice, and I have not seen Vice's recent reiteration or anything, but Vice several years ago was, you know, a lot was written about, you know, once it became apparent how poorly <laughs> they were treating, not just, you know, freelance photographers, but just freelancers in general, um, not contractors, everybody, contractors. Yeah, everybody. I mean, just the guy who delivers their, you know, right. by the guy. Meanwhile, you know, the founder is living in his mansion quite literally in, in Beverly Hills. So, you know, look, we, you know, not to be overly cynical, but it, the, the athletic kind of reminds me to some degree of that. It's built its name into a solid name already. I actually, for a sports fan, it's a good site, you know, but for somebody that would want to contribute to that, um, 
you know, you're just not, it's just not an adequate, fair contract, in my opinion, that, that takes care of the, the contributor, even at a reasonable, fair market rate. It's so below. I mean, a publication of that nature should be paying at least up in, you know, seven fifty dollars per assignment or something. I mean, I think if I recall, because I look at a lot of contracts, it's something like a couple hundred dollars. I mean, it's equivalent to like a small newspaper rate. It's, it's uh, their, 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 their day rate. Not only is it a complete buyout, work for hire, all that kind of stuff, but you couldn't rent the gear you need to complete the assignment for what they're paying you. Right. So to which it becomes, why would you do the job? But again, it, it, it you know, the, 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 the carrot that's dangled is more of the, the, well, you're going to do that because we'll expose you, your name and, and great things are going to come from this exposure. And, you know, I, can I, I, I just, yeah. let me, I mean, they are, they're picking up writers. They're picking up writers from real yeah, writers. major publications. Right. Yeah. They're not, uh, they're not playing. I don't think they're working under that general contract, though. When you're when you're looking at some of the names that they have on there, I'd be willing to bet my, I'd be willing to bet my car. <laughs> I'd be willing to bet a house payment. Neither of which is very high, by the way, because <laughs> I drive an old car and live in a small house that I bought thirty years ago. But um, I can tell you that I don't think at all that they're going to get big names in the sports world for a you know two hundred dollar day. Um, so I think there's tears in these situations. No, they're, they're, they've signed guys from major publications, like you said, yeah. for they've pulled them away from big jobs. Yeah. You paid them more, not less. Of course. Right. And then they want us to fill in the blanks with, uh, you know, great photography that it's, if you actually do a cost of doing business, you're losing money. Yeah. You're literally losing <laughs> money. You'd be better off doing a shift at McDonald's than shooting for the last athletic. And, and you know, we, 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 we've said that before and I've talked about that before. There's some legitimacy to something like that. I personally would respect and admire and follow the same path. If I was in that boat to go take a job, driving an Uber, driving a Lyft, working in some capacity, completely outside of photography. If that meant that I could control my work, shoot, what I want, work with clients that offer me fair contracts, but maybe not as often, you know, not as many uh, assignments. So I would be more willing to go that route than to give it all away to a major media company that has CEOs that they're paying in the six figures and seven figures and all that type of stuff to which you're actually losing money. It just does not make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. You're not even producing the type of work you want to produce probably. Right. That's, that's the thing. Could you imagine, you know, uh, Ernest Hemingway going out, getting his marching orders from uh, some suit in New York City to, uh, to write about Cuba, and then they get to publish the book and get all the profits from the book, you know, you know, the old man in the sea, whatever. I mean, it's just like, right. it's crazy. It's crazy. It is. It is. And, 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 and <laughs> I, show, I show this it's a couple of videos, but there's one video that I workshop has people howling with laughter because it's so real and it's so to the point. And it's these various situations where this guy is very professionally done. This guy goes in to like a, a diner, a real diner. I mean, he's like this old man that's behind the diner counter. And he says to him like, okay, so I'd like to try one of your breakfasts first. And, you know, go through this whole thing. And then, but if I come back, I want to discount and then you know and then he goes to like a guy that makes picture frames and he says okay if i bring you my business then i get all the picture frames for free for the next five years right and and of course like they do it almost uh in that in that gag way from that one actor that goes around and gags people i forget his name but um sasha barico uh right, right. So, yeah, and, and these people are looking at him like, are you out of your freaking mind? Who does business? Like, get out of my shop. They're literally like, get out of here. Right, right. It's like, that's exactly what they're asking us to do. You know, it makes no sense to me. Um, and again, I would rather see a young photographer take on a secondary job and go produce work for clients where they're not giving that away and or produce work on their own where they're really producing some really nice, strong photojournalism and then taking that, to publications that might publish it 
receiving a licensing fee and building your name that way. Right. So tell me in that, in that regard, you, I know you've, you've spent a lot of time um, putting together information and trying to, trying to help people with this, uh, with this uh, land, you know, just minefield full of like contracts and business practices and everything. What, what exactly are you doing these days as far as uh, speaking to colleges and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, just trying to, ha you know, I, I, I developed this workshop, you know, called the Business of Photography Workshop uh, in 2013, after talking a lot with my friends and colleagues, that there really wasn't much out there as far as uh, what I could do, I mean, what we could do to help spread the word. In my opinion, and I've done a little bit of research on this, there uh, are a few known universities that are, that uh, will bring business practices into their uh, photography and photojournalism programs. Um, but man, are they few and far between. And, and even that which they're doing is not comprehensive in any manner. The result is we're graduating every year a whole bunch of skilled, talented photographers from, from, from the you know, perspective of, yes, they can create images and they can light and they can shoot video and create audio and you know, so forth and so on. But they're being launched into a freelance world. But the university, they're pretty much approaching it as they did 20-something years ago, like there's this big market of people that are looking to hire you when they come out. It doesn't happen. So these young photographers are ending up being presented all of this business contract language, and they're just, oh, I got to sign this. I got to sign this. That was somewhat of the catalyst for developing this. Um, so I teach it, you know, uh, wherever somebody wants to bring me in. So I do speak at colleges. I do speak, you know, I've spoken at NPPA and ASMP, and I, I do these types of things and webinars. Um, but the actual course is held a couple times a year at UCLA here in, in Los Angeles, and then uh, other places if they want to book me and bring me up. It's, it's, you know, we go deep, deep for two days. It's 15 hours. Um, it really hurts your brain, but it's very practical. It's not theory based crap you know it's like these are my real contracts these are real emails i get for people asking to use my images this is how i've developed uh some clients this is how i deal with infringements um these are rates i put up you know rates that i know for fact are real here are the rates with the terms so you might get 450 from the new york times i'm throwing that pretty sure that's accurate it might be 425 or something, uh, but it's a work for hire. You're going to get this from AP. It's work for hire. You're going to get this from uh, Bloomberg. It's not a work for hire. You're going to get this from the Wall Street Journal, which is actually a pretty good little contract as far as I've seen. You know, it's a $400 newspaper rate, but there's uh, there's no copyright transfer or anything, so you can retain those images. So I try to present as much information so that people at least have a foundation from which they can make some rational decisions. You know? No, it's uh, it's such important work, and it's so frustrating. I've shot a lot of uh, college sports, and I see the photographers, you know, and they're 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 so enthusiastic. They have so much skill. They have so much talent, and they're getting a a, a good basic like photographic knowledge. But then I'll see that the the professor of the program actually shoots for like yeah. say to today's sports or something like that. Yeah. It's like, yeah. That's part of the problem, Ken. It's actually, you know, I, 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 anybody that tends to speak up a little bit and I try to always be as respectful as possible, but you know, you're going to ruffle some feathers and you're going to create some, you know, uh, you know, a little animosity at times. And I, I've done that with the, within higher education because I really do believe to some degree um, that they are a, They've just been so slow to prepare their students um, for a uh, for a successful transition from college into the into the profession, and part of that is because a lot of professors have not worked in the profession, especially in this last ten years where so much has changed that they don't really know how to approach it. And I and I'll I'll give you one specific example: um, a professor I know um, literally was trying to get all of his students to work for free for uh, the American Diabetes Association um, under the guise of trying to, you know, get them exposure and experience covering a walk and all these types of things. And, you know, I just said, I 
can't condone something like that. If, you, if they're good enough to do something for an organization like that, then they should be compensated for it. Um, there's no reason why the organization can't compensate them. There's no law that says if you're a university student, these kids are taking on insane amounts of debt. For God's sake, let's do everything we possibly can to help them, you know, earn a little bit of money either while they're in college, but definitely when they, when they you know, catapult out of it. The debt load, the debt load we're throwing on these kids um, to, to enter a field that I don't know how they're ever going to pay it back. It's just, it's, 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 it, it, it pisses me off. Yeah, it really does. And it, and it hits me hard. Again, my son isn't going into, into the field, but it hits me hard because I look out and I, the, the, a lot of my students are my son's age. So I see my son, right. I see him and his capacity for wanting and wanting to go into his career. And he's very hungry for his career to start. And he's very excited. And I get all that, but you know, my son's career will be one in which he can actually earn a living. There's none of these things that, that uh, is, is facing him that, that, that photojournalists are facing. I mean, the photojournalism profession, if we haven't figured out, it's freelance, man. You know, I mean, the, 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 the percentage of staffers is, is shrinking by the day. All you have to do, and I provide these statistics in my course, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics does these studies every year. Go look. It's, it, they are paid professionals to go out and project what these industries and professions are doing and the direction they're going. It, you don't have to be a scientist to know that staffs are going to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. So we better have some sound foundations on how to earn a living as an independent photographer or you're just, you know, it's, it's not going to work, man. It's just not going to work. No, it can't be done, though. Yeah, you know? no, I, I agree. I'm, I'm not pessimistic about the future. of. No, I know you are. I, I'm like the true believer, which is, you know, very, not a great place to be, but yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Todd, thank you, uh, for all this. I'm going to, I'm going to link to your workshop. Hopefully, you know, okay. some, uh, okay. universities will invite you out. Uh, I usually like to uh, get a book recommendation. I'm throwing that right in your lap is a big surprise. Do you have any, uh, a go-to book that, uh, is a must, a must well, I mean, you probably had others say this. Yeah, I mean, what I uh, truth needs no ally. Oh, you know that's I mean? a great one. No, nobody's yeah. ever said that one. That's a. That's oh, a really? One. Wow. Yeah, that's what I tell all my well, especially my photojournalism students because I do teach some photography students as well. But uh, for 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 photojournalists, truth needs no ally is is I think um, you know a must read, um, and I think it's 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 relevant today as it, it was when it was written. So. Um, yeah, that's that's one that, uh, and any other, you know, to throw out others, not specific books, but I think it's really important that you read books, um, you know, on on copyright. You know, <laughs> I actually have one right here by Ken Norwick. You know, I mean, his his latest book that you can see has all sorts of you know, nice. markings and so forth. Yeah, I mean, you need, to, you know, these are things that you just have to be knowledgeable on on things, and and hopefully, you know, read enough so that you can can help yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and I, can I say thanks to you real quick for a couple things? One, for doing this, uh, for giving me an opportunity to come on and, and talk to you, and and also for talking to me to some degree about my pictures as well. Because in the last, you know, I'm a photographer, and and you know, uh, in the last several years, I, I get talked to a lot more often about the business side of things, which is great. I I, I need to help and spread that word. That's my way of trying to give back. Um, but it's also nice to be able to talk about the fact that um, the business side is only important because I take my photography, you know, really seriously, you know, well, so it's been nice to be able to talk about some of my pictures. <laughs> no, the, the pleasure, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. And um, keep up the good work. And I, thanks. I just, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing for the, uh, for all of us out there. And, We'll talk again soon when another uh, another big development happens, which shouldn't be too far. <laughs> yeah, right. Great. All right, Ken. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.